Good afternoon. Thanks for coming today. I'm Tracy Bates. I'm the Chief Curator for the Department of the Interior's Museum. And it's a pleasure to welcome you here to this latest installment in our public lecture series. As many of you know, these presentations tend to encompass a very wide range of topics, scientific, historical, cultural, environmental, to reflect the very diverse workings of our bureaus and the Department of the Interior as a whole, past and present. And today's program encompasses many of these elements as we'll be taking a look at how decommissioned oil and gas platforms are being repurposed into artificial reefs, supporting an abundance of marine life. Uh, very quickly before we get started, I did want to point out to all of you that you have on your seats this feedback form, and we encourage you to fill those out and leave them on the table as you exit. Um, that really helps us uh, to be able to um, provide the best possible lecture series for you. If you have topics to suggest, we welcome those as well. In terms of programs we have coming up, we have happily been able to reschedule our speakers that had been postponed from January. That, uh, that lecture didn't happen due to the shutdown. So on Wednesday, May the 29th, a little bit of a departure from the, we usually do them earlier in the month, but May 29th we'll be hosting a USGS research ecologist, Dr. Kristen Hart, and Bureau of Ocean Energy Management marine biologist, Doug Piakowski, to learn about sea turtle biologging studies in the Gulf of Mexico. So you don't want to miss that one either. Um, to turn our attention to today's presenter, who is here all the way from Louisiana, and uh, we got those cherry blossoms out just in time for you. Um, Doug Peter is the Artificial Reef Coordinator for our Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement, better known as BSEE. In this role, he serves as the principal advisor, both regionally and nationally, on matters related to artificial reefs, as covered and provided for under various acts, plans, and related legislation, which I'm sure he'll touch upon in his remarks. He has a master's degree in marine resources management from Texas A&M and nearly 20 years of experience developing and managing artificial reefs for the states of Louisiana and Texas. He is Bessie's lead reviewer for all rigs to reef proposals and associated permitting and reporting, participating in related compliance efforts as well. He also handles outreach and coordination efforts with the various agency stakeholders and industry contacts responsible for managing their respective reef programs. So he works quite a bit with the Army Corps of Engineers, Coast Guard, and NOAA, uh, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And what this all boils down to is that Doug sounds like he has a pretty neat job um, and is also the perfect person to be telling us more and answering your questions about rigs to reefs. So please join me in welcoming Doug Peter. Uh, thank you uh, for inviting me to come down here and give you uh, a little talk on the history and perspective of uh, rigs to reefs. Um, as was touched upon, uh, I spent 14 years with uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife's uh, artificial reef program developing uh, rigs to reefs back when uh, Bessie was MMS. So I had a lot of coordination with uh, MMS at the time. Um, at, later in my career, I transferred over to Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries and became the artificial reef coordinator for that state for six years. So uh, that was a little interesting because uh, I got involved with some of the hurricane stuff, which uh, we are still uh, dealing with some of that, but uh, that's finally come to a close. And um, in 2013, shortly after Bessie was formed, I actually uh, got the position current position I'm in now with the Office of Environmental Compliance down in the Gulf of Mexico region. So, I mean, as I mentioned, uh, MMS was one of the key figures in getting together studies and uh, getting together uh, collaboration between the different stakeholders and determining, you know, what role platforms would play uh, at the end of their life. Um, it was determined that through a lot of these studies and this coordination is that uh, these, these platforms were designed to uh, withstand hurricanes and other forces out in the Gulf of Mexico, which meant that they were also very stable, durable structures. And one of the unique things that happened since the installation of these starting in the 40s going on and the first actual decommissioning was in the 70s was realized that they provided a hard substrate that went from not only the seafloor but all the way up to the surface. Well, granted, you know, the light and stuff at the top provides a lot of photosynthetic uh, areas and stuff for a lot of marine organisms, but, you know, we have other concerns in the Gulf of Mexico, and so, unfortunately, we couldn't leave these structures standing straight up out of the water. But uh, did provide some unique habitat that we didn't see elsewhere uh, in the Gulf of Mexico 
in that you know we had such high profile uh, hard substrate. And during this time, and after a lot of these studies and things were going on, is that uh, NOAA uh, was tasked by uh, Congress uh, with the National Fishing Enhancement Act to develop a national artificial reef plan. Because prior to this, artificial reefs developed around the nation were pr primarily done by private entities, not by the states. There was sometimes state involvement because states and even the federal government had monies to participate in some of these programs. But they were creating a lot of artificial reefs out of materials of opportunity. And over time, we've learned that not all these materials of opportunity were the best materials. So this uh, act required you know, NOAA to kind of develop a national artificial reef plan to provide guidance to the states and also set up these, uh, the ability for the states to develop their own artificial reef program state by state. And uh, this has been amended once in 2007, and it's kind of a living document. It doesn't mandate everything for the states other than that they provide a plan that's equivalent or better than the national plan. This just slide just kind of shows, uh, you know, the progression of how uh, this all came about. Um, it's more from a Bessie perspective, and that in 1985, after the National Fishing Enhancement Act, uh, MMS at the time uh, formalized Riggs Reef Program with the decommissioning of uh, oil and gas platforms. Um, we don't technically have a true Riggs Reef Program, but we have we are the regulatory authority over the uh, installation and final decommissioning of platforms. And so their ultimate fate is either going to shore for scrap or eventually becoming some other opportunity for the state. In this case, for Riggs to Reef. We do have uh, some uh, regulatory authority over that. And over the time, we have uh, reissued our Riggs Reef policy within the agency. Uh, we had different perspectives. And in 2005 and 2008, hurricanes kind of caused us to reevaluate the program. Uh, at that time, I was looking at it more from a state level, but I was interacting with BOMRI at the time and I guess MMS that, you know, what we were going to do with all these down structures because 2005-2008 uh, uh, severely damaged or destroyed about a little over 200 platforms in the Gulf of Mexico. So uh, that caused a lot of applications to come into the state programs to develop artificial reefs that not all those were conducive for reef development. And so there are a number of public meetings and stuff held by uh, Bomery at the time and went out and evaluated, you know, the policy and that's how we came about with this 2000 interim policy document that we go by today in developing and continuing Riggs Reef in the Gulf of Mexico. I guess I kind of went over this. That, uh, so that policy then, you know, just put the brakes on dozens of reef proposals that uh, were incorporating platforms that were either severely damaged or destroyed. And, you know, we, we were taking some heat at the time from the commercial fishing industry and uh, some NGOs on, you know, that these weren't traditionally uh, developed for rigs to reefs. But uh, going forward uh, after that and in 2013, uh, we evaluate all these platforms on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, there isn't a rubber stamp for each of these. Uh, we look at each platform application as proposing rigs to reef and determine whether it meets the different environmental and engineering criteria set up by our agency and make sure that it's in compliance with the National Fishing Enhancement Act. The different state programs each manage their rigs to reef program differently. So part of my job is to make sure that those programs are following their own guidelines to make sure that we're not allowing authorization into their program without following the guidelines of the National Fishing Enhancement Act or their state programs guidelines. Um, generally, when we're doing rigs or reefs, we discourage the use of uh, explosives as a severance method for uh, removing these structures. I get into this a little more of like there's different ways of making a rigs or reef. Uh, not all these are reefed in place, some of these are towed. And one of the big key things is that 
going forward, we're eliminating storm toppled platforms from uh, consideration as reefs because they weren't properly prepared for uh, reefing. Um, usually what happens with the storm damage one is that what happens is the decks and stuff are actually what usually causes the structure to fail because you have these huge 30, 40 foot waves pounding on the decks and cause them to topple. And they have, you know, living quarters, processing equipment, whatever's on the deck at the time. And that's that wasn't clean for reefing. Uh, the parts that have typically been reefed within a program are the jackets itself, which are just structural steel. There's no processing equipment or any other uh, hazardous substances associated with the steel. Um, you know, Bessie continues to uh, support the, you know the Riggs Reef Program. You know, provided it meets uh, our Code of Federal Regulations, and you know. These structures can't just go to a private entity. They have to go to a state artificial reef program. Um, the states have to get their own uh, reef building permits from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. I do a lot of coordination with the different core districts in the different states in uh, accomplishing this. Uh, there are certain areas in the Gulf of Mexico that uh, you know have lightering and shipping lanes and stuff that we have to stay out of, so we do a lot of coordination with the U.S. Coast Guard. And we try to get these reefs, uh, these structures cut down to appropriate navigational clearance so that they're not a hazard from at least a shipping uh, sense. And like I said, we evaluate all these structures and review them, you know, through different. I'm not the only one that reviews these uh, applications. Uh, actually, our sister agency, BOEM, does a lot of the environmental review for us because during these decommissionings, there is heavy equipment that comes out there to set up anchors and stuff, and there is different things going on, and all of that process is laid out in their decommissioning plan. And we evaluate that and then give approval to move forward. Actually, most of them are in federal water. Yeah, the National Fishing Enhanced, or the National Artificial Reef Plant actually designated that states could develop off their shores and into federal waters out to the EEC. Uh, so the reason they have to get, the, I mean, they'd have to get a core permit in the state waters as well, but they definitely got to get a core permit in federal waters to develop the area. They usually, like Texas's uh, artificial reefs are usually 40 acre sites, maybe up to 160, and Louisiana's sites are typically 364 acres. I mean, each, each state varies and depends on the situation. Yes. Do you manage any of these We do not manage the actual artificial reef sites. We just go through and make sure the state's getting the permits that uh, we, we do, uh, during the uh, decommissioning process and evaluation of a structure becoming a reef in place, uh, Bohm and Bessie, different parts of our agencies, uh, evaluate you know whether there's resources that still need to be extracted, whether there's infrastructure that might be impacted if this reef is developed. Because once the reef site's developed and they're starting to put stuff in it, they can put other things besides rigs in there. They can put a ship in there, other materials. So we want to make sure wherever the states are creating these sites that it doesn't unnecessarily impact current leaseholders, future leaseholders, our ability to extract known resources underneath the site. So there's basically um, two main methods. There's been some variations over time, but partial removal in place is kind of a preferred initiation of an artificial reef site because it usually starts off with a bigger structure, something that's eight pile that may be the base of the structure covers anywhere from a half an acre to acre in size at the base. And what we're trying to do there is uh, leave as much profile of that structure up in the water. Um, navigational clearance and stuff requirements will require the structure to be cut at a specified depth. And the top section is either taken off and taken to shore for scrapping or is taken off and placed uh, next to the base as seen in that top picture. And so you create, you know, some more vertical habitat uh, in that area without losing the entire structure. And partial removal is probably the least destructive on the existing critters. Um, they um, usually are using abrasive cutters. Um, they Companies don't typically use explosives mid-water. Um, there is allowance within our regulations to do it, but 
to date, I have not known a company to do that. They've always used abrasive cutters or uh, commercial divers to cut the structures at the required clearance. And so it's the least destructive method of decommissioning structure, but leaving it in place as a reef. So you don't lose uh, any of the fish or the sessile organisms that are on the structure. The next, uh, or in the early days of the program, um, a lot of the structures were actually explosively severed 15 feet below the mud line per regulations, and then they were toppled in place. Um, that partial removal actually didn't come about until 1995, which is almost uh, 10 years after the Riggs Reef program started in the Gulf of Mexico. But uh, realize that doing that, you get the navigational clearance, you would, you know, come up, uh, you'd meet other requirements, but using explosive severance uh, usually causes detriment to the living organisms near the explosions. Uh, you lose a fish uh, initially. Uh, a lot of the sessile organisms are shaken off the structure. So while that habitat's still good, there's a whole recolonization phase of that structure through that process. So the toppling in place generally uh, has been not completely phased out, but partial removal has replaced that for reefing in place. But because of the way the state programs are structured, they're not trying to take up all the uh, Gulf bottom as you know artificial reef habitat. So a lot of these structures are actually towed to these 40 or 160 acre sites and placed near the initial structure that was the development of that artificial reef site. So the companies have an option. They can use explosive removal to sever the jackets for regulations or they can use mechanical cutters. Uh, I do have to say that, just looking at the data more recently, the uh, number of uh, explosive removals has gone down over time compared to you know the 70s, 80s, and probably into the 90s. It's not saying it's not happening, but it's mechanical cutters have come a long ways, and they're able to actually do that in a little more environmentally friendly way of removing that structure and then towing it and placing it on its side. Structures typically have to go through a whole recolonization period because a lot of those critters that were at the bottom are now up in the water column where they weren't before because you do have stratification of organisms down a structure. If you, what's in the top 80 feet is not the same that's maybe at 200 feet. So as it stands today, um, we have just over 1,800 structures left in the Gulf of Mexico. At one time, there was close to 4,000 structures at any given time in the Gulf. A um, total of 7,000 structures have been installed in the Gulf of Mexico since the 40s. So uh, it's been a lot of structures removed. Uh, a lot of them were initially put in shallow water. A lot of them were single pile caissons. So, but if you look at the different pictures, you, you can see that they coming in, come in various sizes and shapes. Uh, picture on the far right with the structure laying on its side, uh, that's Bullwinkle. I, I want to say the base of that is actually a two acre footprint and it's in I believe 1400 feet of water right now. Uh, we're already in discussions of what's going to happen at the decommission of that structure. That's not your typical rigs to reef in the sense that that one takes a little more planning and work to determine you know, what its final fate is. So far, uh, the capture rate has only been about 11% across the board in the Gulf of Mexico for the states. Um, there's a number of factors that determine whether a structure goes into a program. Uh, as I showed before, a lot of structures were put in less than 100 feet of water. Um, that's not necessarily economically viable for the operators to participate in the programs and also getting the navigational clearance and not uh, impacting other user groups such as the uh, commercial shrimping industry is a lot more problematic when you're in shallower water. So uh, a lot of those structures have been removed and taken to shore and scrapped. <clears throat> but as you see as the water depth gets deeper, structures become bigger, more complex, uh, and then a lot of the conflicts between the different user groups is lessened to a certain degree uh, once you get further out uh, from shore and Outer, on the outer continental shelf. But so, so far there's 
552 of the uh, federal OCS platforms have been reefed. Um, there's about another 50 state platforms where operators have opted to take the structures and tow them out into deeper water and to establish reefs. This is just an example of um, a reef site that has 19 oil and gas structures in it. Uh, this site's roughly 180 acres. Um, water depth is 240 feet. And uh, so there were two or three platforms that established this site, and then a lot of these were towed in. And the uh, picture on the top just shows you know, one of the structures has been down a while. You can see some fish and stuff in it, but the <coughs> picture below it uh, actually has uh, spring coral and black coral that is kind of rare in certain parts of the world and it's doing quite well on some of these structures especially in this water depth. Um, one of the things that didn't really touch on is that the Gulf of Mexico isn't homogenous across the entire Gulf as far as the type of water, the clarity and stuff. I mean things around the Mississippi Delta are a lot more murky. Uh, we do have dead zones that appear quite periodically now and things like that and so but then we go further west and you get over to where the Flower Garden Banks is, 100 miles offshore. It's crystal clear water most of the year round. I mean, there's actually a thriving uh, coral community on salt domes. And so there's a lot of variation in these reefs uh, across the Gulf of Mexico. And, you know, that plays a part in why some reefs are developed and others aren't. Because, you know, at the end of the day, the states are developing it's not for economical gain. They're develop them to uh, help enhance their fisheries so that, you know, anglers and different user groups have recreational uh, opportunities, even commercial opportunities. So uh, the development of these reefs is quite varied. And like I said, the states actually help determine a lot of that because they're the ones ultimately taking the liability of these structures and maintaining these structures into perpetuity. Uh, that ends kind of the more of my formal part. I'm going to take some questions and answers, but I'm... <laughs>